The thing about ocean acidification. Climate change is in the spotlight, and deservedly so. However, carbon dioxide emissions have an additional effect which may prove to be disastrous. Some people may call me a warmer or a doomer. I am fine with that because I rather err on the side of caution. So what is this additional effect? It is called ocean acidification. The dominant mechanism for sequestering carbon dioxide comes from calcifying sea organisms. So now we get into a little bit of chemistry. Calcifying organisms like plankton take calcium ions and combine them with carbonate ions to create calcium carbonate which is used to form their skeletons and their shells. Eventually, these organisms die and sink to the bottom of the ocean, where they get transformed into limestone thanks to their calcium carbonate content. If you ever go to the Channel Coast of either France or Great Britain, you can see white cliffs along the shores. These are made out of limestone, i.e., countless of tiny sea organisms. So what does the basic chemistry look like? Ca2 plus plus CO3 2 minus is CaCO3. Calcium plus carbonate is calcium carbonate. There's a snag though. As the concentration of carbon dioxide in the air gets bigger, at the ocean's surface CO2 dissolves into water and the following two reactions occur. Carbon dioxide and water react and release one hydrogen ion and one HCO3- ion. Subsequently, the HCO3- turns into another hydrogen ion and releases a carbonate ion. Logically, you would think that if there would be more carbonate ions, that more calcium carbonate is being made. But that is not the case. The hydrogen ions, or protons, want to associate with the carbonate ions more than the calcium ions do, which is a very simple way of putting it. It's all about giving and taking and sharing electrons. This means that there is less carbonate ions to bond with the calcium ions and this means that there is less carbonate available for the skeletons and shells of sea creatures. In fact, shell forming organisms at this point start to deform, slowly dissolve and eventually die. When we consider the marine biosphere, we see several critical problems on the horizon. Let's address these in sequence. If plankton goes, Practically all fish will be gone, cascading from sardines all the way up to whales. 2. I have a hard time picturing what will happen if we lose one-third of the oxygen supply of the world. Will we manage, or will the atmosphere change dramatically? 3. Carbon dioxide concentrations will rise regardless of what we do, and global warming will become a complete runaway process because the predominant carbon dioxide sequestration method has disappeared. So what do we have to do? Pull the handbrake on carbon emissions. So much is clear. I wonder when we are too late, though. We have dropped the pH of the ocean by a tenth, from 8.2 to 8.1. This doesn't sound scary, but the threshold for having a healthy microscopic marine biotope is a pH of 8.0. The pH is directly correlated to the amount of hydrogen ions or protons in the water. And with an increased carbon dioxide uptake in the ocean, we have an increase of hydrogen ions, which means that by keeping the combustion economy running, we are slowly but surely killing a lot of life in the oceans. Our hand is on the kill switch. We know that this lowering of the pH in the oceans can be catastrophic, as we have found ample geological evidence to suggest that an abrupt increase in carbon dioxide from the eruption of the Siberian traps a supervolcano in Russia had almost killed all life on the planet many millions of years ago in what we call a mass extinction event. 
Let's see what Dr. Alexander Canara has to say about a possible solution. Note, this footage has been made by Gordon McDowell. Please check out his channel and subscribe. Dr. Canera came to our original Google conference. Uh, it was our second conference. And if, uh, if I remember right, uh, he came as a pretty good skeptic, came to slap us around. I would encourage you to go to your local environmental groups and your local chambers of commerce, whatever you can, whether you call it advocacy or preaching or whatever, you should, uh, you should go ahead and do that. Here is Dr. Canera, one of our, one of our great uh, advocates. Our problem lies in the fact that we emit nine gigatons of carbon, three times that as carbon dioxide per year today. And we've been doing that for quite a few years. The carbon cycle that we sequesters to limestone at the bottom of the seafloor only can sequester about 300 million tons. That's 30 times less than we emit today per year. And this was updated recently by a recent study in 2013. Went from what was originally thought to be about 200 million tons to less than 300 million tons. So it hasn't changed very much. The fact remains that what we emit is 30 times what the Earth can sequester. That is obviously the opposite of the word sustainable, right? So therein lies our problem. Our history is that We've emitted over 500 billion tons of fossil carbon in the last 150, 200 years. That's the, that's the industrial age. Obviously, in 150, 200 years, we're not going to be able to recycle that or sequester it. It takes 1,500 years to take what we've already put into the atmosphere and oceans for the nat natural carbon cycle to sequester back to deep storage. So that, therein lies our problem. We are 1,500 years behind the natural carbon sequestration cycle. All right? So this is what we've done. So this is pre-industrial, 8.2 pH, and we've brought it down to 8.1 on the average in just 150, 200 years. That's the entire average ocean pH on a planet. Pretty uh, impressive achievement for one species on a planet to achieve in only 150 years to correct things. We're going to take the natural cycle that does the carbonate sequestration to the seafloor via life forms, and we're going to reverse it. So what happens is the carbonate is sequestered under the seafloor. It gets pulled down under uh, an, in an ocean trench between two tectonic plates. And some of it, it gets heated back into magma. The CO2 is stripped from the carbonate, and it comes out of volcano. OK, so that's the natural cycle of things. What we need to do is do what we do when we make cement, but do it better. So when you make cement, you take 70, 750 grams of limestone that these animals made at the base of the sea, and you heat it, you get the CO2 out of it, and you get the lime, and you have this lime now, which is calcium oxide, magnesium oxide, which is exactly what those animals in the sea really can use, and you take it back to the ocean and dump it in. So like we carry the mail and we require aircraft companies to carry the mail, right? We can require shipping companies to carry the lime and disperse it in the ocean if they're ever going to use any of our ports. I mean, you can think of ways to do it. But the point is that we do what the, we currently do with the cement cycle, but we keep the carbon dioxide out of the air. Right. We have to keep the carbon dioxide from going anywhere uh, into the air. If we look at how a real cement factory works, 10,000 tons a day of limestone go in, 5,000 tons of lime comes out about, and the CO2 going out through the furnace here uh, is the rest. Right. So we need to capture that CO2 and we need to do something with it permanent. 
processes or other processes that have been suggested. Here's the sequestration of that CO2. This is a traditional idea. We pump it into an old oil well, but it can leak out through the clay and so forth. This is a new idea just recently published where you can take basalt, which is under, underground and all around the world. There's huge, vast amounts of basalt from la lava. Remember, the lava that's spewed by a volcano has had its carbonate broken apart. The carbon dioxide has come out, and what's left is lime. So basalt has lime calcium oxide, magnesium oxide, iron oxide, other oxides in it. So you can actually take carbon dioxide, bubble it through, down through a water column that you're pumping and just sequester it in basalt deposits that are loose. And that makes carbonate, rock, permanent, permanent storage. That can be permanent. So here's what we need to do. We need to dissociate limestone, take CO2 out, sequester the unusable CO2, perhaps use this, the carbon uh, and split water, carbon and hydrogen, and make various chemicals, Kim and, and I, and there's another chemist that have talked about how to actually do that. But we can make carbon neutral fuels this way by simply taking the CO2 out of limestone, taking the re resulting lime, put it back in the oceans, and proceed from there. This is a large amount of energy. And we need that energy to make the carbon hydro hydrocarbon compounds that we want to replace current fuels with. And then we're going to have a huge amount of CO2 left over from the reverse cement making process, right? Which we have to sequester. Remediation requires breaking apart limestone, taking the CO2, dealing with it, using it, sequestering it, taking the lime, dumping it in the oceans. And these are some of the numbers. These are kind of worst case because I'm sure the chemists and uh, people who know catalysts and so forth can get the better ones. But the activity required here, requiring energy to do this, amounts to 91 gigawatt non-emitting power plants running 24-7 today. So if we want to correct, correct 30 gigatons of carbon dioxide emissions per year, then we need 10 times that. So we need a terawatt of power, clean power, no emissions, a terawatt of power just to do the CO2 work, breaking apart limestone, and sequestering the CO2 in some ways, using the CO2 for fuels and so forth. And then we have to have additional power to get the if we want to get the H's out of H2O in order to make the neutral, carbon neutral fuels. So we're talking about several terawatt, terawatts of non-emitting power that we need well before 2050, 2050, well before 2050, probably before 2035. You need to talk to your environmental groups, your representatives in Congress, our wonderful Congress, that we have a true, true Apollo 13 moment that we have to address very quickly, very substantially, even more substantially than simply replacing the existing fossil fuel power with clean nuclear, etc. Et there you have it. We are faced with a problem of gargantuan proportions. We have to start working on remediating civilizations carbon dioxide emissions, for if we fail, the consequences may indeed be catastrophic. Thank you for watching. Please leave a comment, press the thumbs up button and subscribe.